meaning of each prayer. The right way is to know what you're doing. That's the right way. There's nothing you need to say. This standing before the prayer saying, Inni nawaitu and usalliya arba raka'atin muqtadiyan bil imam muttajihan ila al-qibla and so on, so on, so on, so on. So this whole is not from the sunnah at all. The point is, when you went to make wudu for the prayer, what prayer were you going to make wudu for? If you knew you were going to make wudu for Doha prayer, there is your intention right there. You don't have to make another intention. It's clear. But if you are making wudu, you don't know what you're making wudu for. Then yeah, you do need to stop for a minute and make your intention of what you're planning to do. And then uh, just try to remember. Huh? If we make an intention of four rakah, but then the, the karma starts, and then we can uh, use it to do rakah. If you make the intention for four rakah, and the karma is set for the compulsory prayer, uh -huh. then we use our to do rakah. Oh, you're saying if you're making sunnah? Yes. Sunnah before. If you made the intention to do sunnah, and the karma starts, right before you start your prayer. Well, you already started your prayer. Well, no, no, you should complete whatever you made that intention for. However, uh, the strongest opinion with regards to the iqama when a prayer has begun, right? If you have started a sunnah prayer and the iqama is given, then the strongest position is to abandon that prayer and join Jamaah. That is the strongest opinion. No. You can pray it afterwards. The very fact that the Prophet ﷺ showed that whenever uh, you know you miss a sunnah, you wanted you had intention to do it, you couldn't do it, or you started and couldn't finish it, you do it after the prayer. You can do it. Most of the cheese rennet is of cow's origin. Is it halal or haram? Well, if the cows were slaughtered uh, by Christians or Jews or Muslims, then the product of it is halal. If it was slaughtered, if it's coming out of China, where the people are communists, then the rennet coming from China, you have to assume, is haram. Oh, a lot of marshmallows and jellies and whatever. Uh, if we have a choice, then what is qadr? Oh, somebody, I set up somebody, something in somebody's mind in the last class. Huh? If we have a choice, what is qadr? What is qadr? Qadr is Allah's knowledge of things before they occur. And that these things happen in accordance with Allah's knowledge. We have another suggestion. It would be advisable to keep the exam on Sunday. <laughs> because it is the middle path. <laughs> and because Brother Riyad Ansari, who is teaching Arabic here, would be happy. His classes have been cancelled because of our course. Well, if you want to vote on Sunday, See if Sunday will if we get better than 24. Those in favor of having the exam on Sunday, raise your hand. Okay, I want to pray special Nafu prayers for Nafu prayers for Shukrana. Meaning Shukr, I guess. Thanks, giving thanks to Allah. Well, there's no specific prayer, but you know, if one makes two rakah of nafila and thanks Allah, you know, for something which has happened for them, it's permissible, it's no harm. The double mean is salat al-shukr, it is clear that there is no salat. Yeah, there's no salat specifically called that, which you're going to call salat al-shukr. But to pray two rakah and to thank Allah, you know, it is permissible. goes on and Allah knows everything and he has decided everything even how much 
risk a man will get? And where is the choice? You see, he knows everything and decides everything, meaning that he knows what is going to take place. He has already, uh, he knows how he's going to interfere in your lives to support your choices or prevent you from making your choices and the consequence and everything. But it is still your choice. If you have no choice, then the judgment becomes meaningless. Why judge a person for something they have no choice over? This is why Prophet Hassan said that the pen which records evil against us is lifted from the child until they reach puberty, from the insane until they regain their sanity, from the one who is sleeping until they awake because they don't have control or knowledge of their actions. Lack of knowledge, uh, lack of consciousness, people are not held responsible. The common practice nowadays in the masters is to have separate rooms for ladies, at times especially at Dhuhr, if there is only one lady present and the males are also less than men, uh, then now, does that mean that the lady is far away from the actual prayer, assisted only by Mike, and there's a big gap between them? Should she pray with the Imam's Jama'ah or not? Well, if she's in the masjid, she should pray with the Jama'ah. <clears throat> I mean, the issue of the practice of uh, separating the woman in rooms where they can no longer see the Jama'ah, actually, this is Bidah. This is Bidah. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Masjid, the women could see the men, the jama'ah, could see. So if the imam went into sujood for tilawa, he's read a verse and he's gone into sujood, everybody knows. But now if women are praying in a room locked off, the imam goes into sujood for tilawa, they think he's gone into rukur, so they went into rukur, and he says, Allahu Akbar, and they come back out, and he is actually standing back up, and you know, it's confusion can mess up people's prayer. You know? So some of the leading scholars like uh, Chef uh, Nasruddin and Bani, Chef Ben Baz, they ruled that it was bid'ah to have these uh, separate separations in the masjid, where the women are closed off completely. Please confirm exactly which pages we need to revise for the exams, <laughs> since we only just got the books. We have a couple of days before the exam. Well, those of you who were taking notes from the beginning, you know what was covered. Those of you who were not taking notes have to read. <laughs> Is the recitation of Surah, surah Yasin, not Surah Tul Yasin, so Surah Yasin. On a daily basis, after Salat al-Fajr, forbidden? No. If you like to do that, no problem. But if you're doing that believing that there is some special reward for it, then you are mistaken. Whatever you heard that if you do it after Fajr, you're going to get this reward or that reward, this is not authentic. Is there a special reward for Surah al Yes. Surah al Surah al Mulk, Surah al Kahf, Surah. <laughs> no, no, these are valid. These are valid. Can Salat al Istighfar seeking for repentance? But there is no Salat al Istighfar. There's another, you know, and Salat al Shukrana is the same thing again. Be performed on a daily basis. These are no, these are, there are no such prayers. Pardon? Such that the shukr, yes, that the Prophet Sallallahu did, you know, perform sujood at certain times when good things happen, etc. Yes, such that the shukr is permissible. During the change of Qibla, was the Prophet the Imam? No, he wasn't. <clears throat> it was the Prophet Sallallahu who informed the companions. They went to all the masjids where people were praying and informed them, and then they changed. Who are the Ash'arites and the Maturidites? This is a, when we get back to Aqidah, next level in Aqidah, we'll get into that. 
<coughs> Salat al Hajjah, no such Salat. Prayer is Sunnah in the mosque. After praying Fart Salah in the mosque, people change their place. Well, there are some narrations about changing the position uh, in the uh, Sunnah Rabi Dawood. Some are da'if and some are sahih. But it's not a requirement. Somebody tried to rationalize it saying, well, the more places you make frustration, as the more places will testify for your day of judgment. But we could just as well say, if you pray in the same spot, the spot will testify more times for you on the day. <laughs> <laughs> so this kind of argument, I mean, unless it's coming from Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, it's better to stay away from this. The, salat, the exam will cover only the subjects you have discussed or the whole study module. What we have covered. Of course, I explained to you this. Other material in here, which our course was too short to get into in more detail. That information, like the biographical information, and that you're not responsible for. Just the basic material which we covered uh, <coughs> over these five days, that is what your recovery required. Okay, they asked about what is the meaning of Musarrat. Musarrat, this is the same uh, sheep or goat where the, the teats have been tied and the other is filled with milk. <clears throat> you mentioned wine is haram and in English it's called alcohol. Are sprays and aftershaves haram? Well, <clears throat> we should note that we use the term alcohol <clears throat> chemically to mean anything which has an OH molecule attached to it. We call it such and such alcohol. But it doesn't mean necessarily if you drink it, you're going to get intoxicated. Maybe you drink it and it'll kill you. Okay. So drinking it, you know, it's haram because it, you, to drink it, it will kill you. But the alcohol, what is prohibited of alcohol is the drinking of alcohol. What is prohibited was the drinking of alcohol, specifically. Other than that, the argument that it is najis, because you know there is a verse where Allah does say, in the Malkhamru and Maysi and Aslam, all of this is ridges from Amr al Shaytan, ridges meaning najis. The argument that this means that Khamr is najasa, so to put it on yourself, you're putting najas on yourself. This argument is a weak argument because what is including there, Al Maysir. Maisir is gambling. Well, Aslam, this is the uh, arrows used for divination, you know, like a Ouija board. To say that the Ouija board is najis, if you touch the Ouija board, it's going to break your wudu. So, the, it is talking about najasa, which is ruhiya, and it, it is filled with regards to the spirit, not with regards to <coughs> the physical. So, Khamar is not considered to be najis. So therefore, if one uses it for cologne or whatever, it is permissible. If you drink it, it's another situation. If it's an ingredient of medicine, or we have like this, um, kind of cough syrup, and things like that, it's not an intoxicant. Okay. The question of where alcohol may be found in some medicines, right, in very small amounts. Yes. Now, there's some medicines the cough syrups, it's in large amounts, right? Because it's known in America, if you can't afford, you know, buying alcohol, they will buy cough syrup. Rabutessence is one of the popular ones. You drink a couple of bottles and you'll get high. Okay, so they are intoxicants. We're not talking about those cough syrups which have high amounts of alcohol in it. But ones which have very minute cut quantities, which no matter how many bottles of this thing you drank, it would not intoxicate you. Is that permissible? Yes. Medicines, as I said, any of these medicines where if you, or drinks, or if you could take even um, vinegar, Vinegar has a percentage of alcohol in it. It exists in it. And the Prophet ﷺ permitted it. People came with their drinks, the nabid, and they asked Prophet ﷺ about it. These were fermented drinks, 
means once it ferments, a portion of alcohol is now in it. Once the fermentation process starts, alcohol is being produced. So he permitted them to drink it for the first two days, the third day onwards, no. Meaning, once it became an intoxicant, then it was no longer permitted. What would intoxicate you in? Larger, whether three glasses of it would intoxicate you, then it means haram. But if the percentage in it is so small, no matter how much you drank of it, you would die from, you know, from uh, putting too much liquid in your system before you would be intoxicated. You know, such a, a substance is considered permissible for use. But now, <clears throat> can Muslims produce that? Can you now make medicine using alcohol? No, it's haram. Because you would have had to produce it. You would have had to buy it. See, to buy or to produce alcohol is haram. So, to make those medicines is forbidden for us. But if it came to us, right? This is like the difference between somebody making, uh, making um, vinegar by starting with some fruit juices. They cover the container and wait until the process ends. And then you have vinegar. You can take this, you can use it. There's a percentage of alcohol in it, you're not held accountable for it. It's not considered. If you, it had to go through a process in the middle there, it became alcohol. It became a vat of alcohol, pure alcohol. And then it went into vinegar. Right? If you bought alcohol and then continued the process and, and produced vinegar, for you as a Muslim, that's haram. But if a non-Muslim did that and wanted to sell you vinegar, you can buy it. This is the Z. Can you understand the difference between the two? The end product, if it does not intoxicate, then it is permissible to us. However, if that product, if we to produce that product, it requires you making alcohol or purchasing alcohol and adding it to the mix, then it becomes haram. That means Muslims don't need to produce vinegar? No, no. Sister, as I said, if you make, if you, if you produce vinegar by uh, the fermentation process without stopping the process, because, you know, you let the process go completely before you uh, open up the vat or whatever. You let it go right through. And that's a, you know, for example, when you eat food, it goes into your stomach and it ferments in your stomach, alcohol is being produced in your stomach. This is why Western medicine says, if you drink a half a glass of wine with your, with your meals, it helps in digestion. This is their argument. And it may be true. But we say, the benefit you get from that half a glass of wine in your digestion, when you compare that to the harm that comes from making alcohol permissible in the society, it's better we didn't take that benefit. That benefit is really of no benefit, no consequence, when we compare it to the harm that comes from the use of alcohol in society. And Allah talks about the Quran. He said that in, in alcohol there is benefit, but the harm in it is greater than the benefit. So it's not something new. People will benefit. But the point is that the, the harm which is produced by it is so great that it is better to avoid that benefit. That benefit becomes insignificant. I'd like to know about the pharmacies. You work in a pharmacy. You work in a pharmacy. Selling medicines, which might contain drugs, drugs, drugs. We don't know. Small quantities, as I said, which will not intoxicate. What you don't know, you're not held accountable for. And if you know, you need the drugs. If you know, then you don't sell it. Actifed makes you feel drowsy. Well, is uh, the drowsiness that you feel from Actifed, is it intoxication? Does it impair your ability to judge, your ability to judge, to walk, to, you know, the things which they usually use to determine whether you are, you are mentally impaired? No. So then we don't consider it. Uh, are you allowed to manufacture perfumes? Are you allowed to manufacture perfumes? 
Because there's some amount of alcohol in it. But as I said, are you allowed to make yogurt? There's a certain amount of alcohol in yogurt. Non alcoholic beer. Non alcoholic beer is halal. Yeah. And yes. But the use of beer coming in the same containers that the alcoholic beer comes in becomes questionable. Whereas Prophet he ordered his companions to destroy the vessels, this is in Sahih Bukhari Muslim, destroy the vessels that they used to keep their alcohol in. <coughs> Guardians, meaning in some schools, meant parents. Is a half of a question? give charity to the Sayyidis wherein they don't know for sure only they say that they are Sayyid from the great 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 grandfather in such such a case can we give charity to them? Sure you can because you know those people who are claiming to be Sayyids they don't really have evidence for it just stories claims you know. <clears throat> could you please please postpone Please, can we have a test on Tuesday? <laughs> can you label cigarettes, cigars, and pipes as intoxicants? Yes. They also have an intoxicating effect, well-known effect, for those people who are non-smokers. Right? If you take a cigarette that you've never smoked before, and you take a camel, camel cigarette, not a camel, camel cigarette, which is the unfiltered, and you smoke it completely through, you will, your head will be spinning, you will be falling down. Somebody asks you to walk a straight line, you couldn't walk it. And this is how they test people for drunkenness, right? In America, commonly, the police will tell you, get out of your car, they draw a chalk line on the side of the statement, they ask you to walk that line. If they see your feet are going this way and this way, and it's, they say you're drunk, and they take you away. Similarly, a person who smokes uh, for the very first time, any person who is a smoker, he knows he or she had to build up a tolerance. Right? You can't just take a cigarette for the first time and just go, <laughs> no way. You'll be coughing, you'll be blue in the face, you'll be really. You have to build up a tolerance little by little because your lungs naturally reject it. Your system fights against it because it's something unnatural, it is something which the body detects as harmful, so it tries to repel it. So you have to build a tolerance. You know, you kill those nerves, you deaden the nerves inside of the lungs, you know, so eventually you're able to just inhale, just like breathing. And if you've seen those pictures of people whose lungs who smoke, and those who don't smoke, it's scary. For women to remove hair on their arms, legs, and face, except eyebrows, is it allowed or not? Well, the majority of scholars hold that it is permissible. Um, the removal of hair from the face, in general, uh, it is preferable not to. I mean, unless we have a case where a woman is growing so much hair on her face, she's starting to resemble a man. You know, she's growing a full beard, or her eyebrows fill in between, become very heavy, you know, it's disfiguring her. In such cases, scholars have permitted her to remove what is necessary enough to uh, confirm or support her femininity. Because, of course, Islam stresses the difference between males and females. That's one of the reasons also to why the idea of shaving, you know, where a man is now looking like a woman. Because women are the ones who don't have beards. It's one of the distinguishing features of the men and the women. Right? <coughs> Can you explain the major work of al albanis authentication of hadith? If it was so important, why no one has been able to do it for 1,200 years or so? Well, the process of authentication has been ongoing. 
Shaykh Masuddin al Bani for the Sunan, the hadith of the Sunan, he gathered those authentications and revised them, etc., and used them to produce an authentic uh, Sunan Abi Dawood and separate out the Da'if Sunan Abi Dawood into two different books. And I mean, his, the, the effort that he made is a very uh, great effort, but it's not without error. It doesn't mean that he caught everything. You know, there's some places where he thought the hadith was da'if and it was in fact sahih. Some places where he thought the hadith was sahih and it was in fact da'if. Something. And this happened to scholars before him. Not nothing new. The tablet in Isab contains some teachings and statements or stories which contradict Islamic teachings. Then why isn't it opposed by Muslim scholars openly? Some scholars say that it is to avoid fitna, but isn't this book a greater fitna to our deen? I don't know about it being banned in Saudi. But I know Bahish Zawar is the one that should be burned. <laughs> that one definitely needs to be burned, right? But that just contains so much, you know, false and fabricated material, really. Tabligh uh, al-Nisab, I mean, the point is with Tabligh al-Nisab, and I would say, maybe about a third of the information is objectionable. But two-thirds of it is still authentic hadiths, etc., and commentaries, lives from the Sahaba, authentic information. So uh, on the basis that the book is not without value, I mean, if we are to take any book where there are some mistakes in it, or there's a quantity of mistakes, and we say we just reject the whole book simply because of the quantity, then one would just say, we, we would end up discarding many, many very, very useful books. So one would say just that one has to be careful when reading Tabir and Isab, uh, where we have things that are supported by Bukhari, Muslim, you know, authentic hadith, we go with it. Those things that, which are doubtful or not, we never heard of it before, then find out. Don't just start to practice everything you read. <clears throat> Why do you disagree with Bin Baz and Al Bani with regards to a woman traveling without a mahram for a journey of less than a day and a night? Well, I mean, if uh, the person who's asking this question is uh, ex expressing that my position is if the journey is less than a day and night, uh, the woman can travel without a mahram for a journey of less than a day and night. My position on that is, is that that's the case because of the fact that there is a clear statement of the Prophet Muhammad to that effect. There is a hadith, which is the general hadith, which said a woman shouldn't travel without a mahram. General. But the problem of that is that it is a general statement, and whenever we have general statements, if there are specific statements which identify time frames, then the general principle is that you take the specific statements to clarify the intent of the general statements. So uh, <clears throat> this is not just my opinion, but that of a number of, of other uh, leading scholars who have taken up this position also. If you barely catch Jama'ah for Fajr prayer and you didn't say the Sunnah before it, can you pray it after fun? Yeah, after sunrise, yes, you can pray it. Is Surah Al-Fatiha compulsory in prayers? As long as you're able to say it, yes. And this is an important point, you know, because there is a practice that has developed in some parts of the Muslim world where among kids and some adults too, in Taraweeh, right, where the Imam did so. There are no authentic hadiths. Because they are deliberately avoiding saying Fatiha when they could. Between Fajr and Sunrise, that you can pray in the Sunnah. Between Sunnah, yeah, Fajr, yeah. If you miss the Sunnah, you can pray it after 
after Fajr, that is if there is time between you and the sunrise, between that prayer and the sunrise. Is it allowed for us to eat the food of Muslims who are earning from haram means? For example, banker, banker, banker. <laughs> A banker, yes, it is haram, and stolen food, yes, haram. If you know they've gotten their uh, meat, the, the money to buy their food from haram sources, then you should not eat their food. During a tahiyat in namaz, people continue moving their shahada finger. Why do they do so? They do so because Prophet Muhammad did so. There are no authentic hadiths to indicate that he only raised his finger at the time of saying Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah and putting it down one time. No authentic hadith to that effect. What is authentic is that whenever he sat for tashahud, he put his hand in this position and he moved his finger continually. Now, the moving of the finger, you know, some people may go to extremes where they're moving their finger like this. <laughs> Because Prophet ﷺ did say that it is stronger against Satan than iron. So they get this idea in their mind that there's Satan there and they're beating Satan with their finger. No? This is a, you know, we're going into kind of interpretations that we don't have to, we don't need to go there. Right? It is enough to know the movement because the finger was pointed towards Qibla. Now if you whipping your finger from all the way up here, are you pointing to Qibla anymore? All the way down there, are you pointing to Qibla anymore? No, you're off for Qibla. The finger should be to Qibla. So the movement should be between uh, up and down enough that still keeps you in the direction of Qibla. And if we look at the movement in relationship to the rest of the prayer, we know Prophet Muhammad he told people who are praying quickly. People who are praying quickly. We know Prophet Muhammad told them to pray slowly. That each movement should be, you know, allowing the uh, bones to go back into place. You stand up, you pause. Everything is done slowly. So even this other movement, right, where the people, you know, shaking, this is it's against the whole, the rest, the whole of the salah, you know, calls us towards calmness, you know, slowness of movement. And then all of a sudden, we got this thing sticking in there. It's incongruous. It's, it doesn't belong there. You know, it's out of place. With the rest of the prayer. For the whole time that you're in Tashahud. What about reading Surah Al Fatiha when conducting Salat with Jama'ah? What about reading? Yeah, if you join the prayer when the Imam has already gone into Rapur, not deliberately, you join the prayer, then you can. Uh, you count that rak'ah because this was a time when you were unable to recite Fatiha. Some people were saying, no, you didn't recite Fatiha, so you have to repeat that rak'ah. It's not authentic. From Muhammad Sallallahu had said, whoever catches the rak'ah, the rupur, sorry, has caught the rak'ah. Also, it is valid, and this might sound strange, that if you come to the masjid and the, the jama'ah has gone into rupur, you are allowed to make rukur from where you are and walk and join the jama'ah. Yeah? yeah, the Sahaba did it. The Sahaba did it. So it's permissible. I mean, it might seem strange today because nobody's doing it. I mean, just like, for example, praying with your shoes on. I mean, if you're if you're out in the outside and you're going to make jama'ah someplace, you're traveling or you're out on the desert or whatever. You know, people still take their shoes off and go to pray with it. And if you're going to keep your shoes on and pray, you know, that's this. But in fact, it was from the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu to pray with his shoes on. So when you're reading it, uh, with the Imam, you have to say Surah Al-Fatiha after he finishes? Or? Oh. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi also said that the recitation of the Imam is the recitation of the followers. So where he recites aloud, then you just hear him, listen to it. Where he recites uh, silently or quietly or in a low voice, you can't hear it, then you recite yourself. After, after and uh, Zohar. Huh? After and Zohar, but he's silent. 
ourselves. Yeah, and in Asia, you know, the second two rakah of Isha also, and the third rakah of Maghrib, we recite ourselves. So there are some people that you are supposed to recite even when he is reciting No, there are different opinions on that. Some say you should recite at the same time as he's reciting. Some say you leave a space and then you recite afterwards. The leaving a space, of course, is bid'ah. Because there is no evidence for that in the sunnah at all, leaving a space there. Right? Secondly, reciting at the same time, we have authentic narrations that the companions said, we used to do that, and then the Prophet ﷺ instructed us and we stopped. And so the final command is the command of the Qur'an, that if the Qur'an is recited, you should be silent and listen to it. I recently heard from someone that Imam Bukhari was the same person as Imam Abu Hanifa. <laughs> Nonsense. Is it okay to work in an Islamic bank, although we have no proof that their system is really Islamic? Yes, it's permissible. <clears throat> the evidence that we have externally is that it is Islamic. We know today that musical instruments are forbidden, yet I find that even people who are against music, who don't listen to it at all, still do not hesitate to fix musical tones in preference to the simple ring of the phone or their mobile phone. <laughs> is it allowed? Truly, it's something that people yes, need to consider. This is, uh, how do you know it's a system? <laughs> Was that, was, was that a pre-planned question? <laughs> uh, uh, yes, the, I mean the musical tones of the phone is forbidden. We should not do it. It's music. We're producing music. Hmm? Rough raising the hands. Other than the raising of the hands at the time of the takbir, the initial takbir. No, it's not compulsory. There are some narrations which indicate in Prophet Sallallahu authentic narrations where he only uh, raised the hands on, on the, with the first takbir. So it, on some occasions he did, but the vast majority, it's mutawatir, the companions narrating that he raised his hands. So this would be the most common practice of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In Salah, should we prostrate on our foreheads or with our forehead and nose? The forehead and nose must touch the ground. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi pointed to it and said, you know, this was the uh, forehead. So both the forehead, forehead or forehead and nose, both should touch the ground. Regarding the Hanafi Madha, the teaching that recitation of Surah Fatah and prayer is not important goes against the Hadith. The Prophet Yes. Uh, the present state of people following this Madha, they are way beyond the religion of Islam, places like India and Pakistan. Well, not in everything. I mean, at some points, yes. But in all of the schools, actually, when you go into them, you'll find points where they have <coughs> missed the mark in right? all of the schools. In the Shafi'i schools, praying kunut every fajr. Every single fajr they pray. And the position that they hold, that if a woman, a man accidentally brushes against a woman, wudu is broken. You know. So you'll find, uh, commonly in Egypt, if you've if you ever watched uh, Egyptians, if they're going to shake the hand of a woman, they have wudu, they'll put their hand inside of their throat and shake their hand. Yeah. Be, this, is the, this is the rationale behind it. Yeah. They don't want to break their wudu, so they put their hand in <laughs> And Maliki school, we have the majority of the Malikis pray with their hands at the side. right? Not all of them, though. There are a number of them also who pray with their hands uh, clasped, but many of them pray with their hands at the side. And there is no hadith to support this. So, <clears throat> I mean, if you go from school to school and said, all of the different schools, you will find some errors or you know, wrong positions which were taken by the followers at some point in time or the imams themselves, because they were human beings, the point. Meaning that no single school contains all of the sunnah. Taken all together, 
along with the other imams and those outside of the schools, there we have our sunnah. It is said that uh, Imam Monkey's hands are broken up. That's why. No, no, it's not true. Uh, the phrase, uh, the phrase invalidated. But Im Imam Malik's book, Al Muwatta, he states in there clearly that the position, narrating hadith, that the position of the hands in Salah is right hand over left hand. So that was his actual position. Hmm? Uh, the, the list of, of hadith books in, in, the, in the notes. This is the vast majority of them. I mean, I, I, I don't, I can't think of any, there may be one or two which are just outside of this, but this is the vast majority, it's an exhausted list. Yeah, yeah those books, you see, were not true Musnads of theirs. It mentions that in there. And they were collected by others and attributed to Abu Hanifa. Abu Hanifa didn't put together. Why does the math have, why are they given importance then if they contain things which go against Islam? As I said, because the fact that the madhabs are themselves uh, efforts of the scholars before, there's a lot of very useful, beneficial information in them. When we're talking about errors, we're talking about a percentage. You know, the vast majority of the information in the madhabs are, is authentic. You know, they either represent variational differences between school to school, or they are. In agreement, the vast majority, we could say, what the schools of thought, the madhabs, agree upon is far greater than what they don't. That's the bottom line. Both the madhabs agree these books uh, first judgment. What method of hair removal on the face, other than plucking of the eyebrows, would be permissible? Waxing, dissolving, electrolysis? No, I mean, if you're removing the hair from the eyebrows, however you do it, it's haraj. It doesn't mean it is just if you pluck it with a tweezer, but if you take it with wax, you're still plucking it out, but with wax, you know, it's still haram. A uh, question about phot phot photographs, you know, how much uh, of a necessity they are. You know, and they mentioned some tapes that we have, you know, that are being circulated with, you know, people's pictures all over the tapes and things. Are they really necessary? They're not really necessary. Uh, is the prayer in a room where such things are kept affected? No. It doesn't affect the prayer. But uh, it is better to avoid, you know, the collection of photographs, uh, whether it is on cassettes that we're using or hanging them on the walls, these kind of things. This is not uh, Islamically, we should refrain from doing so. <clears throat> okay, I think, uh, oh, 10.30. Uh, go ahead. So I was touching on the eyebrows, and one of my students, my Arab students, were arguing that the white youth is Islamic, so why you can cut them off? Is that true? No, this question is that uh, one of the students had argued that the plucking uh, is what is mentioned in the hadith. So if you cut instead, shave or whatever, you know, then it's okay. Right. If that is their position, then tell them that the Prophet ﷺ said that uh, what the instruction was from removing hair under the armpit was plucking. So ask them, are they plucking the hair from under the armpit or are they shaving? Is it? They're shaving. I mean, who goes around now and plucks out the hair under their armpit? It's quite painful. <laughs> right? But the actual instruction is plucking. If you go back and look at the hadith, it's it's nubt and ibit. Right? Nubt is plucking. So it has been understood from the time of the Prophet that however you remove it, you have fulfilled the requirement. So you shave or you pluck, it's the same. The point is remove the hair. 
So similarly, if you shave or you pluck the eyebrows, it's the same. You have removed the hair. Okay? So just ask her if she plucks her armpits. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, the, the books, the books of uh, hadith criticism and analysis are accepted by scholars right across the madhabs, not limited to one madhab. Inshallah. Anyway, a number of scholars, scholars from many different backgrounds. At Tahawi, I mentioned to you about Mushkil Athar, he was Hanafi. Uh, Ibn Hajar, he was Shafi. You know, and other scholars who have written Muatta, which people also use and has an analytical information, is Maliki, you know. So it, the books went across the schools. The, the scholars of Hadith, they didn't focus on schools. Whatever their initial training may have been, people identified them with their schools on the basis of that. But they didn't limit themselves to schools. Okay? Inshallah, we're going to close now. Subhanakallah, hamdika. نشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك